Could we all uh, join together in prayer, please? Our wonderful, kind and loving God in heaven, our creator, our redeemer, we come before you to ask for your help and your special blessing today. And we ask that you'll please help us to understand the truth and to seek your face, and we pray that your help will be upon each one of us. You know our special needs. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be able to come to a, a camp such as this, wherein we may be able to learn. And we pray that you will bless each one that is bowed before you today. And as we speedily head towards the, the final days of this world's history, we pray you'll help us please to have our minds acutely tuned to the things that you have given to us to show us where we are. And we pray, Lord, that you please lead each one of us home at last into your kingdom. And now forgive us for our sin. And now join us, Father, and teach us by your Spirit. We ask it in the precious name of Yahshua. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're privileged to um, have Esther, who has a little poem she'd like to share with us. So just before I start, I'd like, uh, Esther, would you kindly come up and let us hear your poem? Thank you. This is called Daniel. And I think before the end, a lot of us will be here like a Daniel. Daniel stood in the lion's den, but he wasn't the least afraid, because God had closed the lion's mouths. He answered when Daniel prayed. But I think he heard those lions roar from the mouths that God had closed, for they looked down at him with their hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. All night long they paced the den on their great big restless feet, for they were starved and the good was there, goods were there, but they weren't allowed to eat. The slava dripped from the hungry mouths and their stomachs hurt all night. And they looked at him with their hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. Daniel prayed in the lion's den. He prayed there all night through. And just as soon as it was light, the king came down there too. And Daniel cried, an angel closed the lion's mouths last night. So they looked at me with the hungry eyes, but they weren't allowed to bite. And <clears throat> the Bible says that the time will come we'll all, when we'll stand in the lion's den. This world will be the den I'm in, and the lions will all be men. And they'll try to destroy the children of God. They'll hurt They'll hunt for them day and night, and they'll look at me with the hungry eyes, but they won't be allowed to bite. And I hope that the time will come when you will stand in that den with me, and then we'll pray to Daniel's God and wait as patiently as Daniel did when God heard his prayer and sent an angel bright to close the hungry lion's mouths so they weren't allowed to bite. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. How are you enjoying the diet? Wonderful, isn't it? I always get a spiritual blessing when I come along to a camp such as this. If I were to ask how many people here love and worship and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, I think I would probably see all hands go up. And then I would say, well, why do you have such a faith? And in the world today, we have so many voices saying, here is Christ or there. And we wonder sometimes, well, why is it that we don't follow after some of these others? And there are some things that we would see with these various voices trying to convince us that they are right. 
And have you ever seen up in some of the clouds up in the sky, they almost like you could get out and stand on them. They seem solid. What we need is something solid on which to stand our faith. And what I want to share with you today is uh, a few things which will help us to see that Christ, the one we know as Jesus Christ, is truly the Son of God, the promised Messiah. And there's approximately, one researcher has found, about 332 individual prophecies which relate to Christ. That is a lot. And later on, as we work through, we're going to see how that that number of prophecies absolutely eliminates all competition. So let's work through that. And the centurion that said, truly this man was the son of God, had to have something to convince him that this one that was hanging on the cross was in fact the son of God. The wise man came to Herod. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, of course, that was the, the very thing that Herod wanted to hear that day. And his response was not exactly um, all that favourable, though being a diplomat, he kept his cool. And then he went out and he summoned the high priests and the various other learned gentlemen among the Jewish nation. And he asked them, something about this king. Now, it stands to reason that being in a Jewish community like this, the Jews would have been talking about this wonderful prospect of a coming Messiah. This Messiah is going to liberate us from these terrible Romans. And, of course, Herod went along and he said to them, where is he going to be born? Who is he? Tell us about him. And so then... The uh, the religious leader says, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem and a whole lot of other prophecies about him. And so there we see that of which salvation, that is the salvation through this Messiah, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching water in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, there were a lot of prophecies put in place that would enable you and I not to mistake the one who is truly our Saviour. Now, we know, uh, after noticing such a quote as this, that uh, no prophecy in the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. That means we don't read this particular prophecy and then put our interpretation on it. The Bible is its own interpreter. For the prophecy did not come in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. (coughs) So now if someone comes to you and says, he's here or he's there, don't believe it. For these there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible will deceive the very elect. There are a lot of voices out there saying here is one and here is one. You know the great movement today is such that we want to join all the churches and in joining all the churches all the various saviours if you like Krishna, Buddha and many others are saying that this is the way, or at least that is one way to salvation. Here is another way to salvation. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You go and say this to them, and straight away you've created a schism between you and these people that are pro- promoting other, other prospects. And this is the thrust today. And what we need to understand is why we believe that this one known as Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God in the promised Messiah. There was a man by the name of Apollos, and he was um, an eloquent man. That means he spoke well. 
He was mighty in the scriptures and he came to Ephesus for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, in public meetings, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now I'm sure that in, back in those days there would have been all kinds of uh, avenues to salvation that would have been going around at that time. For we know that in the world there are God's many and Lord's many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, right? and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So, Apollos convinced the people out of the Scriptures. What does that say for us? If we want to get the details, where are we going to go? To the Scriptures. Now, just have a look at that verse. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Stop. Now, maybe the Jewish nation made this mistake, that when the Father said to them, cleanse your ways and, make your, and get the sin out of your life, what was their response? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. We're Jews. We've got the oracles of God. There's the temple over there. We've got one foot in heaven. But no, he says, but they are they which testify of me. In other words, the scriptures on which you're hanging so much is really telling you about me. This is what Christ is saying. And I'm the one who can save you. <clears throat> I can just imagine Philip running up to Nathaniel and he says, We've found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We've found him. How did he know that this lowly carpenter's son was actually this promised Messiah? Evidently there were some things in his life which were revealing this. And then Christ entered into his ministry and it became more clear to the people. So, let's see what we're going to cover in our study on these prophecies with respect to the promised Messiah. We're going to have a look at the timing of his appearance, his lineage, in other words, the line through which he was born, his suffering, and some sundry prophecies, reasons for these prophecies. And then, could it be that this wonderful figure that appeared in history, the divided time, could it be a coincidence? He just happened to fit the bill at the time. But he's not really the Messiah. Is he an imposter? Well, let's keep going. With regard to the timing of his appearance, now that passage in Ezra there <coughs> tells us, uh, just before I mention that, you recall that Nebuchadnezzar and his army besieged Jerusalem back around 506, I beg your pardon, 605 BC. And when he uh, besieged that city, he took away some captives to um, Babylon. Daniel and his other friends, as you know. And by the end of the 70-year captivity, these, um, the, uh, there were still some people alive who actually saw the previous city. And look what they say. Many of the priests and the Levites and the chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice. So some of the men who were still alive when they were taken, out of cap taken into captivity now saw the, the city that was, and the temple that was going to be built and they said, it is not as good as the previous one. And then, of course, there were some there that shouted for joy. They were the younger fellows and they thought, hey, this looks pretty good. But the ones that saw it before didn't think so. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes by comparison as nothing? And I will shake all nations. In other words, what God is saying now is, I'm going to alert all nations something about this place. He says, the desire of all the nations shall come. And I will fill this nation with glory. <coughs> Then he goes on, the glory of this latter house, the one that the old fellows said was not as good, shall be greater than the former. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord of hosts. 
So this message that God is giving is that this place now is going to be greater. In what way? <clears throat> I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. We've got two messengers there. Who are they? The first one, of course, is John the Baptist. And the second one, very clearly, the messenger of the covenant is the Son of God. From the fourth volume of Spirit of Prophecy, the second temple was not honoured with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of one in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifest in the flesh. And Christ said, in this place that's within Jewry, is one greater than the temple himself. It is by the Messiah coming to the temple that it is going to be greater. Now, fairly clearly it goes without saying that he had to get there before it was destroyed. And Christ said, well, this wonderful temple that you want so much is uh, going to be destroyed. And that, of course, was fulfilled in AD 70 uh, by um, uh, the Roman army under one of Caesar's generals, Titus. So further prophecies regarding his appearing. We've just seen now that Christ came to the temple. Now this narrows down a time point when he had to appear. Like there's no point saying now someone is going to take, someone could still fulfil the prophecies because the temple's already gone. Did you know that the Jews are even considering or they want to rebuild their temple? They're in Jerusalem. And uh, in rebuilding the temple, they want to uh, re-establish the, uh, the sanctuary services. And then, of course, the Messiah will come because he'll come to the temple. But, uh, but Christ has already been, of course. Now, the exact time of his ministry and his death was established many centuries before they actually occurred. We can, we can see the year of his ministry and the year of his death, the actual day and the hour of his death. And of course, these are fulfilled where we see that Christ is actually a partner to redemption. Notice this. <clears throat> the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Here Christ knows what's coming up and he's prepared to go ahead with it. That to me spells of love. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christ and his Father were co-partners in the salvation of you and me. So much so that Christ came, to, came time for him to give his life for us. And he was willing to do that. And all the prophecies which pointed to the things that he went through. Now we couldn't possibly deal with all the prophecies here today. Some people think I'm a little long-winded. You would certainly appreciate that if we were to do this. So we're only going to be looking at a few things. And one of them is relating to his suffering. And of course the timing. And the timing of course is one of the magnificent, um, powerful arguments in support that this man was in fact the promised Messiah. And the 70 week prophecy, many of us are quite familiar with it, but just uh, reading these few passages again, we see 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most high, holy. Now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even to the troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolation are determined. And he, that is the Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, 
and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abomination she shall make desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Well, just briefly, looking at the uh, 70-week prophecy, this itself is a study all on its own, which would take quite a while to work through. So basically it says, from the decree to go forth and to rebuild Jerusalem. Now that date can be easily traced back to 457 BC. And then in seven weeks the the streets will be built. Well, the, the city was rebuilt by about 408 BC, a matter of 49 years. And then a following... 62, three three score and two weeks, then we reach another time. So we've gone um, 69 weeks, and what happened on the 27, year 27 AD? The baptism of Christ, of course. What took place at the baptism of Christ? It was the beginning of his ministry. And then he will confirm the covenant. Who was the messenger of the covenant? He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so we see there that from 27 AD to 34 that uh, that is the week represented. And of course he died right in the middle because in the midst of the week he shall be cut off. So here now we see the 70 week prophecy divided up into the four parts. And this shows very clearly that this could not be an accident. This man came and fulfilled this area of the 70 week prophecy and he came right on time. How many people, how many other people have we known right throughout the the human history where an individual has been planned down to the very hour of their life? I think I can think of none. So there we see the year of the death of Christ and of course the beginning of his ministry were mapped out in the 70 week prophecy. So where do we get the actual day of his death? And for that matter the very hour? Well we have to go to the types to see that. And the types that we see of course is the Passover. Christ is our Passover and then let's have a look to see what happens then in the Passover. On the 10th day of this month, that is Abid which is the first month of the year, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now that term evening is an interesting one. Kill the Passover in the evening. That word in Strong's Hebrew dictionary word number 996 may also be rendered between. So the lamb, Passover lamb, is killed between the evenings. Now, the evening, is, of course, is when the sun sets. And so the evening is measured from just as we notice when the sun moves from the zenith to head towards sunset. And, uh, and then at sunset, of course, that period is finished. The Passover lamb was killed about three, at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's interesting that the lamb of died. Uh, sorry, the lamb of God also died at three o'clock. Now there, Christ was talking with a couple of his with, with his disciples, and he says to them, "I know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified, and then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes." and the elders of the people into the palace of the high high priest who was called Caiaphas. And he consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Now you notice there that the uh, lamb was selected out before the time of the slaughter. When were the priests plotting the apprehension of Christ? some days before the Passover. And then, of course, they want to kill him. Now notice verse 5. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. What was happening there? 
why would they be asking, saying, let's not do it on the Passover? Why? <clears throat> Anyone here ever heard of Don Yitzhak Abravanel? He was a Jewish um, uh, recorder, very brilliant man. He um, was a politician. And he uh, wrote some commentaries and on uh, various Jewish uh, issues and he did one on the book of Daniel and in the section entitled The Wells of Salvation he writes this during the month of Nisan that's another word instead of um, Avid in which the messianic redemption is to occur the cup of Elijah at the Passover meal preserves in symbolism the idea that the new redemption will occur during the same season as the exodus from Egypt. Now what's he saying? When was the Passover instituted? When they left Egypt. And he's saying here that preserved in symbolism is the idea of the redemption which occurred during the same season as the exodus from Egypt. And so at, that, at our anniversary of our exodus from Egypt... Where hold, we hold this Passover, which is a celebration. And so they say that uh, there now, the Jews recognise that the Messiah is going to die on the Passover. They knew it. That this is extra biblical evidence. Now, why didn't the priests want to kill Christ on the Passover? they'd be really causing their own defeat if they did this because the very thing they wanted to do was to discredit this upstart and not spoil their own position with the people. <clears throat> now, so there's the priests wanting them to just hold back and not kill Christ on the Passover. And just imagine now, here's Christ and Peter they are standing there and up come the mob and they want to take Christ. Peter whips out his sword and off goes an ear. And uh, Christ says, Do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Did Christ want to interrupt or stop his apprehension? No. Peter couldn't stop it. <clears throat> Christ himself didn't stop it. His father did not intervene. And of course the priests, they couldn't stop it either. Though they wanted his death more than anything. Now let's have a look at the situation there and the timing of this thing. You see, what makes this prophecy so magnificent? is the actual timing, because it is so perfectly done. Thursday night he was apprehended, that is the eve of Friday, and he uh, was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning. He finally died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And of course the Friday, the sixth day of the week, was the Passover. Now after the Passover came the Sabbath, and you're all familiar with that particular Sabbath being a high day. What constitutes a high day? Well, a weekly Sabbath being concurrent with a ceremonial Sabbath. The ceremonial Sabbath in this particular case was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there we see now that the timing of this has to occur in order for Christ to be the real, promised, prophesied Messiah. No way around it. And um, marvellous how the uh, effects of the, um, the priests were thwarted. In the Jewish Talmud, in a section called the Babylonia Sanhedrin, entitled The Eve of the Passover, we read this. On the eve of Passover, they hanged Yeshu of Nazareth. But they found naught in his defence and hanged him on the eve 
of Passover. <coughs> Again, extra biblical evidence of um, Christ being the one that he claims to be. The Talmud, of course, is that collection of ancient rabbinical writings uh, of Jewish law and tradition on which are based the religious authority in Orthodox Judaism. So, I'd like to spend a little moment on that name, Yeshu. Is this the one we're talking about? Is Yeshu the Jesus Christ that was crucified on the cross? Well, if we have a look at Isaiah 62.11, we see, Behold, the Lord proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. So what's that got to do with Yeshu? Well, let's look, at the, um, let's look at the alternative rendering of salvation. There it is. Yeshu. Deliverance. Prosperity. Safety. Salvation. Saving. The name Yeshua actually means Yahweh is salvation. And then we see from Psalms, Sing unto the Lord, sing praises to his name, extol him that rides upon the heavens by his name Yah, and rejoice before him. Now Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh, or Jehovah. And it means exactly the same thing. Yeshua, Y-A-H, Yah, Shua. Yahweh is salvation. And so when they said they crucified Yeshu, what they're doing is confirming in his name the very one who we are talking about. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Yahshua. Was his death actually coincidental? In other words, did it just turn out that he was crucified on this particular time? Had this been the case, then how do we explain some of the other events that took place? The darkness, the earthquake, the rending of the curtain, the raising from his raising from the dead, of course, the raising of the many from the graves upon his resurrection, and the apostles teaching that the sacrificial system was at an end. You know, this sacrificial system that was the that was the most tender spot that you could touch with the Jews, and for someone to come along and say this is now no longer functional, that is to them sacrilegious. Now, the sufferings of Christ, we well know those passages in Isaiah 53, where he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, and he's, um, he's wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and our chast the chastisement of his peace, our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. His visage and his form were marred more than that of any man. Then he goes, let's looking at what he went through. He goes into Gethsemane and he starts to say, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. <clears throat> and he cries uh, to his father that if this cup could pass from him, then let it be. But not my will, thy will be done. So Christ was sorrowful even unto death. I find this passage of scripture so brief that it, it misses really what Christ went through. In fact, had he not had an angel come to help him and to strengthen him, he would have died there in Gethsemane. And how many of us have been in such grief and agony that we have sweat drops of blood? I don't think any of us have had that degree of anxiety. And yet he did. <clears throat> he says there in Psalms, that he has a broken a heart. Reproach has broken his heart. So what does that mean? That means he is under such agony that his heart broke. Now we hear the expression, he or she caused that one a broken heart. Now that's an emotional thing. And it's a, a stressful thing. But when, what really the term means is the heart literally breaks. It does, it, it severs. And um, he says here in this passage, I'm full of heaviness. I looked and for some to take pity, and there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. 
Then, of course, one of the soldiers came and rammed a spear into his side. And blood and water flowed out. And he that saw it is bearing record that it is true. Now, this idea of the water and the blood flowing out has intrigued me for quite some time. And I finally found some information that put some light on it. And one of the things that I found was a man by the name of Dr. Walsh, Professor of Medicine at the University College in London. He made this statement. In a heart rupture, that is the heart breaking, blood flows into the sac surrounding the heart, which is the pericardium. And may be as much as two to four pounds or one to two litres of blood. This blood actually separates into red blood, which is the haemoglobin, and to the lipid semen, which is the white component. So what this doctor discovered was that under these horrendous stress that, that a person can go through, the blood actually does separate into its two principal components. Now, this will create some water around the heart. And Dr. Truman Davis, on a study, The Crucifixion of Christ, in the Arizona Medicine Magazine. And Davis did some studies on uh, crucifixion, and he made this statement. The escape of watery fluid from the sac surrounding the heart is evidence, not of the usual crucifixion death by suffocation, but of heart failure due to shock and constriction of the heart by fluid in the pericardium. Two separate reports indicate the same thing. Again, regarding death wounds, Frederick Charles Cook commentary on the Holy Bible, and he's quoting a John Murray, who is using some work by Samuel Horton, who's a medical doctor. The noted physicist, no, I'm sorry, psych, psych, physiologist from the University of Dublin, and he has this to say. The rupture of the heart was the cause of the death of Christ as ably maintained by William Stroud. And that rupture of the heart actually occurred, I firmly believe. The importance of this is obvious. It shows that the narrative in St John chapter 19 could never have been invented, that the facts recorded must have been seen by an eyewitness, and that the eyewitness was so astonished that he apparently sort of phenomena, miraculous. So here, this man is confirming what John is telling us here. Now, some will say, when a person dies, the blood clots. In fact, a dead body doesn't bleed. Uh, the reason you bleed is because when you have a puncture, the blood is being pushed out under pressure. But what happens here? With this argument, one would say, well, when the spear went in, the blood would clot and there would not be a flowing of blood and water. Well, there have been some other, other statements um, put forward by authoritative sources. Um, a man by the name of Sava in 1957 reported that he had conducted experiments on cadavers. A cadaver, of course, is a dead body, less than six hours after death. And these experiments proved that when a lance is thrust into the side of the chest, Fluid from the pericardium and the heart with, will flood the space around the lungs rather than ooze its way slowly across the, pink, the pierced lung to the wound in the chest, in the chest wall. <clears throat> Further from Sava, he says, experience with severe chest injuries has demonstrated that non-penetrating injuries of the chest are capable of producing an accumulation of hemorrhagic fluid, that is what flows out when you bleed, in the space between the ribs and the lungs. Evidently, there are the, the sacs that protect these two major organs of the body can receive this fluid. The volume of blood, bloody fluid, varies with the severity of the injury and the degree of response to such an injury. Such collections of blood in close cavity, closed cavities do not clot. The red blood cells tend, by their weight, to gravitate to the bottom of the containing cavity, thus dividing it into a dark red cellular 
component below while the lighter clear serum accumulates in the upper half of the collection as a, a separate though contiguous layer. From a likelihood of hemorrhagic, sorry, from a purely anatomical mechanical standpoint, therefore the likelihood of hemorrhagic effusion or bleeding between the lung and the ribs is far greater than a similar occurrence within the pericardial, pericardial sac. What this man is saying is, this dead body is only just dying, that it will actually have these fluids passing out. So we're not looking at some, uh, some story that someone is putting together. These things really happen. And it is not biologically improbable. It is biologically factual. <clears throat> he died on time, and biologically we have confirmed that what took place on the cross didn't fact actually happen. All right, we said... <clears throat> that <clears throat> another one of the prophecies was that of Yahshua's lineage... He came on time, he died on time, and now let's have a look at um, Christ being um, of the line of David, King of Israel. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his, out of his roots. Of this man, that's David's seed, has God according to the promise, raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. Even in Revelation, he says that I am the offspring of David. So, let's have a look at this genealogy. Now, if we have a look at Matthew chapter 1, you'll see there a line of genetic continuity um, from David down to, um, down to Joseph. And there we see, about in verse 11, one of the, one of the people, uh, Josias begat Jeconias, and Jeconias begat Salafia. So what's the point of this? Well, it's interesting that this man, Jeconiah, there was a curse placed on him. And it's worth reading this particular passage. As I live, says the Lord, though Caniah, that's, uh, the Hebrew, Hebrew um, rendering for Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. This again is further evidence that Joseph could not be the father of of Christ, apart from the fact that Mary was a, vir a virgin, but um, here a curse was placed on one of Joseph's forebears, and so he could Christ would not have entitlement to the uh, the throne of Israel. Yahshua's link was not through Joseph, obviously, but was through uh, another source. In Luke chapter 3, we see Jesus himself being, began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, if you have a look in Matthew again, you'll find Joseph is not said to be the son of Heli. So what's he doing? Heli was of the line of Nathan. Caniah and Joseph were of the line of Solomon. Now that's an interesting thing, because Solomon was, of course, the, the product of David's uh, adulterous relationship with Beersheba. So that whole line was cut out. Heli was of the line of Nathan. Now, obviously, either Joseph's father was Heli, or the one mentioned in uh, Matthew. Clearly, Christ is the son of Mary. Heli had to be the father-in-law of Joseph. 
and it is reported here as the son of or son-in-law of Heber. <clears throat> is it possible that there may have been a coincidence in the fulfilling of 332 prophecies that point to the Messiah? Is that possible? Well, let's have a look at the probability. <clears throat> in the simplest form, I've put together a simple binary comparison. If the one we are considering has to fulfill one condition, he has to be a man, right? A woman could not possibly satisfy the condition. Yes or no? He's got one chance in two. That is, two to the power of one. If there were two conditions, had to be a man and he had to be a Jew. Yes or no? He's got one chance in four. Two raised to the power of two. If he had to fulfil three conditions, he had to be a man, he had to be a Jew, and he had to arrive at a certain time. Three conditions. Do you, do you fulfil that or not? No. One chance, in, uh, one chance in eight. Two raised to the power of three. Now you can see the pattern forming. For four conditions, it will be two to the power of four. And so, some of the sundry prophecies I was, I'm wanting to share with you, um, we're looking at about 43 to 48 of them. If we take the 48 of these prophecies, you're looking at 2 to the power of 48, which is 2.8 times 10 to the 14. Or in other words, 280, or 2 point, sorry, 280 with 12 noughts after it or 280 trillion. Now, how many prophecies did we say were pointing to the Messiah? 332. So, that would be 2 raised to the power of two, uh, 332. Does this individual satisfy 332 prophecies? Yes or no? He's got one chance in 8.75 times 10 to the 99. That is... 875 with 97 zeros after it. Now that to me rivals evolution. It's impossible. There would... How many people have lived on the earth since day one? Would 875 with 97 zeros after it have lived on this earth in that period of time? You know, the powers that be in the world think that 7 billion is an overpopulation. In just a short time, we've had to expand to the number we've got. It is impossible that many people could not live. That means that there is a high probability that the one who could satisfy the, uh, the conditions, it would be an eternity before he finally showed up. So, Yahshua is who he claimed to be, and that is the Son of God. Now, when Christ was talking with his disciples, there on the hill, shortly before he was taken up, and when he'd spoken some things to them, he says, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We have a whole collection of prophecies which point to this one. I said in my opening remarks, how many of us here worship, love and serve Jesus Christ? And we would expect everyone to say yes. We have prophecies which confirm that we are not following cunningly devised fables. I rejoice that this one individual has given us sound reason for our faith. Yahweh does not expect us to have blind faith. You know what blind faith is? 
I know nothing about it, I do not understand it, but I'll believe it anyway. That is those who believe evolution. You can't prove it. That is blind faith. The God of all the universe and his Son have given us well-grounded, indisputable evidence that this one in whom we have based our faith is in fact the real Son of God. And you know what is so wonderful? Because we can believe these prophecies and we have seen them come true and the poor Jews, those Orthodox Jews who are going to rebuild their temple and then wait for him to come, they're going to miss out. And what I think is so wonderful is that this same Jesus is going to come again. And you and I can be looking up just like his disciples on that day when they saw him go. We can look up and say he's come back. How wonderful. And so these things are written that you might believe that Jesus, Yahshua, where God is our salvation, is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing he might have life through him. And then you and I can join the throng that will look up and say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. And I want to in encourage each one of you to think about what these prophecies are telling us. And to reconsecrate your life to the one in whom has given you well-grounded evidence for holding your faith. This one, known as Jesus Christ, is indeed the Son of God. And thank you, God in heaven, for sending him to save us. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Our dear, wonderful, loving, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us wonderful evidence and you have given us the power to understand these things. Come, let us reason together. You want to tell us things that we are able to understand. And we pray that you will open our minds, that we will be receptive of these things. Let us not throw away all things for the sake of some transient pleasure of this life. But we ask you, God, that you will please fill us with the importance of what we're dealing with here. And may we have faith and trust in your word, which tells us about he who can save us. Now, Heavenly Father, as we're bowed before you now, each one giving up their own petition to you, to re-consecrate their lives unto you, to be acquainted with your Son in such a way that we know the real and the living God personally. Keep us now in the remaining hours of the Sabbath. Bless us, we pray, that our conversation and our Sabbath observance will take us into oneness with you. For his sake we pray. Amen. Amen.